Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the inaugural address of Prof. Serena Clausens. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly stand for the academic procession and the university anthem. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. Over to you, Prof. Yaled. Good evening, everyone. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible from the Book of Romans. This is a letter by the Apostle Paul to the Romans when he was in prison. I'm reading from chapter 8, starting at verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Verse 35. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 37 through 39. No, in all these things we are more than the conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 28 is a promise that the Lord works for the good of those who love him. And because he loves us, we can trust him that he is working for our good. In fact, in verse 38 through 39, Paul is emphatic about how deep God's love is for his children. And tonight, we have gathered here to celebrate with Sarina and her loved ones one of the proofs of how God loves success in our endeavors, especially if we do them because we are fulfilling our purpose. Like any other human being that have been around on earth for any measure of time, Sarina must have lived through several trials and tribulations in her many roles as wife, sister, daughter, friend and manager of people, and here I'm thinking of your role as school director, but also as an academic scholar. And like most of us, when times are really trying, she probably wondered whether this particular situation is going to pass. How is it going to end? What does the future hold? And is God really present in this particular situation? At professorial inaugurations, we are reminded of many things. But as humans, so very aware of our dependence on our Creator, this inauguration of Sarina serves as a reminder of the extent by just how much we are loved by our Creator, and that He allows us to experience joyous moments in our earthly life when we fulfill what we are called for on earth. I believe that part of what Sarina was called for in this life was to use her God-given gifts as a researcher, teacher, and scholar to achieve what we are celebrating tonight, a full professor. And Sarina, let memories of tonight be a reminder of just how much our Lord loves us when you continue on your path of living your purpose in his kingdom. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we approach you with hearts filled with thanks and gratitude that we can celebrate Sarina's professorial inauguration. Thank you for the guidance, patience and wisdom you have bestowed upon her, but also on each of us on our journeys of a purpose-driven life, a purpose unique to each individual, but in service of your greater kingdom. And as always, because we are so desperately dependent on you, we ask for your continuous presence and blessing, not just in Sarina's professional career and personal life, but also ours. But Lord, I pray for your involvement in the lives of everyone present here tonight, because without you, we cannot be the beacons of hope you want us to be. May we each be reminded of our purpose in your kingdom. Amen. Evening, colleagues. Uh, perhaps I should take it down a little bit. <clears throat> uh, 
Greetings to you all and a warm welcome to the inaugural lecture of Prof. Sarina Glassens of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences here at Purchase Room Campus. I wish to acknowledge the presence of Prof. Jeffrey Mpatele, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation of Northwest University. Prof. Jeffrey is also officiating today as the main functionary. I would like to note the presence of all other deputy deans, Prof. Helen Drummond, deputy dean of teaching and learning, and Prof. Terry Midupi, deputy dean of community engagement and stakeholder relations. Of the same faculty, the faculty of natural and agricultural sciences, as well as Prof. Francois van der Verstezen, the deputy dean of research and innovation. Many directors of the faculty are also present. I will not mention them by name, but they are also recognized, including all those from other faculties. Many directors, oh sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> A warm welcome also goes to those who are watching online. We have a global audience with friends, family and collaborators joining us from Namibia, the USA, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and from several other countries in Europe. Of course, the most important person today is Prof. Sarina. We welcome you, your family and friends, your collaborators in the industry, and some of them are present here today, I believe, and all uh, staff members that are present and visitors. It is quite heartwarming to see that this inaugural lecture of Prof. Sarina is well supported and the attendance is great, even virtually. I believe so. Uh, Prof. Jeffrey, this is the first inaugural lecture this year at the faculty, and we have many more in the course of the year. No pressure to Prof. Sarina. I know her quite well. It is safe to say that she will set the bar Hi, for those that are coming after her. Um, uh, Prof. DVC, Prof. Jeffrey, I'm happy to, and to boldly announce that the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences is very progressive and is doing a lot to get deserving members of staff, such as Sarina, to be promoted to full professorship. In the near future, I will be presenting another group of about eight applications for promotion to full professor for 2024. Um, this will be serving at the Deputy Vice Chancellor's Promotion Committee of Northwest University. I say this with great pride that our faculty is one of the best at Northwest University. I always say that in all inaugural lectures. So those that have heard this before, please, you can close your ears now. But I can't help it, you know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so, in fact, we, we will also be recommending not just promotions to full professorship. I think it's about 22 or so to associate professorship. So you can see that, uh, you know, the faculty is really, really, really progressing. Um, we have such good quality of staff here. It is also demonstrated by the very high number of NRF rated researchers at Northwest University. We always have the highest numbers, the highest percentages. I don't want to mention them uh, today just because I've mentioned the numbers so many times. But all I can tell you, at least in terms of the B rated scholars, we do have over 60% you know, of the complement in the university. Um, the point I'm making here is that we get uh, excellent, it's not surprising that we get excellent academics such as Sarina in our faculty. And of course, there are many, many, many more in that caliber. You know, he's sitting here with us here today. Sarina is not just an excellent academic, 
Uh, she also has a mind of her own. Uh, she has uh, challenged the faculty on any point that she sees as ambiguous. And we really appreciate her insights and energy on academic matters. The title of her lecture is The Science and Stewardship of Soil Mi Microbiomes. I would like to state that uh, professorship is the highest academic achievement at the university. It is a recognition that one has reached the pinnacle or the apex in academia through research, teaching, and learning, and service to the community. It therefore it signifies arriving at a significant milestone in an academic career. The inauguration ritual therefore emphasizes the transition from one stage of the educational career to the next. Because after being inaugurated, it doesn't mean you stop. In fact, it should be a catalyst for you to do even more. The inaugural lecture allows a new professor an opportunity to share their research with a broad audience, including members of the public in the presence of family, friends, partners, and colleagues. I know you will enjoy the lecture as I know that Sarina is a master at telling her story as we celebrate this day and accept her into professorship. I now take this opportunity to read her biography. Thereafter, Prof. Sarina will take the stage to deliver uh, her inaugural lecture. Uh, Sarina Klassens is a professor in the subject group microbiology and the director of the School of Biological Sciences. She conducts her research in the Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management. Serena was born in Pretoria on the 11th September as the first child and only daughter of Francois and Sunet Lassens. She matriculated in 1998 from Clerkstorp High School and enrolled for the BSc in Biological Sciences in 1999 at the then Potsdam University for Christian Higher Education. She completed the degree cum laude in 2001, followed by a master's degree in environmental sciences, also cum laude in 2003. In 2004, she enrolled part-time for a PhD in environmental sciences at the Northwest University and graduated in 2007. Sarina was appointed as a lecturer in microbiology at the Northwest University in 2004 and was promoted to senior lecturer from 2008, associate professor from 2016, and full professor from 2023. You can see, colleagues, that she didn't really take long in any rank. She was actually really flying. She served as subject group chair of microbiology from 2015 to 2016, and as acting director of the School of Biological Sciences from January 2019 to August 2019 before being appointed as director from September 2019. She has served on 17 North State University committees, boards, or task teams, including faculty and senate committees, and the task team for the Council of Higher Education, Higher Education Institutional Audit in 2022. Her research focus is soil microbiology with application to agriculture and harsh environments. The research includes aspects of biochemistry and soil biology that is published in multidisciplinary journals and has led to several international collaborative projects. Sarina has a C2 rating from the National Research Foundation in South Africa, distinguishing her as an established researcher based on the quality, coherence, and international impact of her research. Before that, she had the Y rating and, and was the first young researcher to receive this recognition for soil microbiology. She is the author or co-author of 41 accredited peer-reviewed articles that have been cited more than a thousand times. Other outputs include contribution to national and international conferences technical reports, and popular lectures and articles. She is a regular reviewer of, for external funding applications 
for international journals of high standing in her field. She also made significant contribution to teaching and learning at undergraduate and postgraduate level and to module program and curriculum development. Over the years, she presented 16 different undergraduate and honors modules, many for which she developed the modules and study guides and practical guides. She has served on various panels for inter internal and external programs evaluations at uh, Northwest University and other South African universities and is active as an external examiner and moderator. To date, Sarina has graduated four PhDs, 18 MSCs, and 32 honor students under her supervision. Sarina is married, happily so, to Piet Janssen van Rensberg. She has a passion for books, people, and travel, and she believes that purpose is not what you do. It is the good thing that happens to others when you do what you are supposed to. I don't know if I can remember that, but I understand what it means. <laughs> it means just do good, and uh, you know, everything else will fall into place. Um, in my last point, I just wish to end on a sad note, uh, just to indicate that uh, uh, we are losing a very important member in uh, our faculty, as Serena will be leaving us soon, uh, in a couple of months or so, and uh, we give our blessings, we wish her well, but we will always remember it will be very difficult to feel the gap that she has left. But um, we appreciate everything that she has done for the university and we wish her well. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> Living and uh, <laughs> I even forgot the important part uh, that uh, we need to. Sorry? The mic. Okay. Uh, colleagues, I just said that <clears throat> I'm so emotional about her living that I, I forgot an important part of the ceremony that uh, I need to dress her so that she can address us in the proper attire. For a moment there, I thought I was going to be able to talk without the hat on, but now I will have to stand very still, <laughs> as was the plan from the beginning. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining me this evening. Um, it is a wonderful opportunity for me to stand here and to share this wonderful um, accomplishment with so many of my friends, family, and colleagues, and also those online that Prof. Modise has already welcomed. The late Afrikaans singer and songwriter, Kouis Duplessis, wrote a song entitled Gebet, Prayer, with the lyrics, Wat het is, 
is net genade. En wat ik het, is net geleen. What I am is only grace, and what I have is only borrowed. I would like to start this evening with the major reason why I am standing here, by grace alone. I thank my Heavenly Father for the talents that He gave me, but more importantly, for the people that He placed in my life. Without them, none of this would have been possible. To my husband, Piet, not only are you the person, oops, <laughs> not only are you the person that I've co-authored the most papers with, but you are also the one that gives me endless support. Thank you for your patience, your kindness, your sense of humor, and for often living with an absent wife, even when I'm in the same room as you. To my parents, thank you for believing in me and for always encouraging us as your children. The examples you set taught us the truly important things in life and gave us the platforms from which to launch successful lives, for pretending that you find it exciting, and for your love and encouragement. Becoming a professor is not something you achieve alone. I am deeply indebted to the many colleagues, collaborators, and students that I've worked with in the past 19 years. You will see many of their names featuring in the presentation. Some of you were able to join me here this evening, and some are watching online. Wherever you are, I want to thank you for your wisdom, your contributions, your good-hearted natures, and for being such inspiring individuals that I could not help but to strive to be better. I look forward to seeing where our collaborations and relationships will lead to in the future. To the present and past deans and deputy deans of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, and directors of the School of Biological Sciences and the Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management, thank you for your support and for the examples you set that I learned a lot from. Thank you, Emma, Dalian, and everyone else that had a hand in the arrangements for this evening. I appreciate all your hard work. And finally, a big thank you to Clarissa Menor for making the PowerPoint presentation look good. Your creative talents are well appreciated. This evening, I want to share my research and insights on soil microbiology and microbial ecology with you under the title, The Science and Stewardship of Soil Microbiomes. In 1975, Wallace H. Fuller wrote these words, a cloak of loose, soft material held to the Earth's hard surface by gravity is all that lies between life and lifelessness. All of us know what soil is, how it looks, what it smells like, and even how it feels between our fingers. Yet very, people realize, very few people realize that our well-being and the livelihoods of human societies are highly dependent on soil and the ecosystem functions and services that it provides. Archaeologists have determined that the demise of many sophisticated civilizations, such as the Mayans of Central America, resulted directly from the mismanagement of their soils. Even today, we are using the world's soils as if they were inexhaustible, continually withdrawing from an account that we never pay into. This evening, I want you to understand that soil is much more than a growth medium for plants with a static set of characteristics. Understanding the environmental and social links to soil ecosystems is essential for our survival of various global challenges we currently face, including biodiversity loss, climate change, food insecurity, malnutrition, poverty, and diseases. It is important to realize that these challenges are interdependent and that humanity's mismanagement of soils, combined with unsustainable production and consumption patterns, are a major driver of all of these. Sorry, just trying to get this sound. 
So poor understanding of soil characteristics and processes exacerbates poor management and unsustainable practices. The study of soil in all its different facets is a daunting task, and there are multiple focus areas underlying soil science. This lecture will first give you an overview of what the framework of soil science entails, and then I will have a look at how soil biology and ecology fit into this framework and more specifically, what the scientific and practical value of soil microbiomes are. I will illustrate the latter with examples from my own research and show the development thereof over time. In conclusion, I will reflect on the stewardship of soil microbiomes and the importance of the research field for current global agendas. So soil science is the study of soil as a natural resource and it investigates the properties of soils and these properties in relation to the use and management of soil. To fully understand all the functions of soil and how these are affected by natural and human impacts, it is necessary to study soil from a holistic perspective, thus considering the physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. It provides an understanding of how soil properties relate to and can be managed for optimal agricultural production, forest, range and wetland management, urban land use, waste disposal and management, and reclamation of drastically disturbed sites such as mines. Soil science also addresses nutrient management, sustainable agriculture, global biogeochemical cycles and climate change, and ecosystem structure and function. Soil biology specifically studies the living organisms, including microorganisms and fauna that inhabit the soil. The study of how these soil organisms interact with each other, with plants and with their environment is the study of soil ecology. Soil is made up of 45% minerals, 25% water, 25% air and 5% organic matter. And these four ingredients react with one another in amazing ways, making soil one of our planet's most dynamic and important natural resources. Importantly, soil as a resource is non-renewable on a human timescale. So while soil formation is taking place continuously, it takes more than a thousand years for a thin layer of topsoil to form. And it is this topsoil that is especially important for all forms of life. It only extends to a depth of 13 to 25 centimeters, but this layer also has the highest content of organic matter and living organisms. It is where most biological soil activity occurs. And soil is very much alive. The more, there are more living individual organisms in one tablespoon of healthy soil than there are people on this planet. Think about that. One gram of soil contains several thousands of different species. Soils host a quarter of all the biodiversity on the planet. And soil biodiversity is key to maintain ecosystem functions and services. So when I talk about ecosystem services, I refer to the set of processes that contribute to human well-being and that is possible through various ecosystem functions. The latter refers to the full range of natural biological processes carried out by soil organisms. For example, one of the key ecosystem functions that organisms drive is the cycling of nutrients through various forms and pools in the soil. This ecosystem function is critical for the growth of crops and hence for the provision of food to human populations, which is an ecosystem service. As you can see from this figure, soil biota, and especially the microorganisms, which are those in the green frames, are critical to all ecosystem functions and services. Although the sustainable development goals do not refer directly to soil, the strong connection between soil biodiversity and achieving the sustainable development goals is clear. Many of the goals are closely linked to or dependent on soil biodiversity. So now that I've stressed the importance of soil as a natural resource, you are probably still wondering about the title. What is a soil microbiome? 
So I will be using the definition that is suitable for the ecological context, and it is based on that of a bio. So taking into account the biotic and abiotic factors of given environments. So let's start with the soil microbiota. They are the living bacteria, archaea, fungi, algae, and protists that inhabit the soil. And when we consider these microorganisms, along with their so-called theater of activity, meaning the microbial structures, metabolites, mobile genetic elements, and relic DNA in the soil, as well as the surrounding environmental conditions, then we refer to the soil microbiome. The soil microbiome performs critical soil functions and plays a key role in multifunctionality. This means the simultaneous maintenance of several ecosystem functions and services. These functions are positively related to microbial diversity, and any loss in diversity will likely reduce multifunctionality and overall soil health. The reference to soil microbiomes in the plural indicates that the functional and structural characteristics of one microbiome differs from the next based on differences in microbial diversity, physical and chemical soil characteristics, spatial and temporal variation, and environmental conditions such as climate. This means that there is no typical soil microbiome. And it follows that direct links between species and specific processes in soil are difficult to identify. Therefore, soil microbial ecology requires the simultaneous study of multiple soil quality parameters or indicators and different levels of ecological function. Given that productive soils are so critical, it is widely acknowledged that soil health is important to measure for assessment and as a monitoring tool to help guide management practices. But soil health assessments and Sorry, the application of microbial communities to improve the soil condition have long been challenging issues, especially in disturbed soils associated with mining activities and agriculture or in harsh environments. This can be attributed to the multifaceted nature of soil as a growth medium and combined with the intricate web of biological life that is inseparable from the physical chemical, and environmental parameters that are not constant. There is a myriad of factors in soil that influence one another. And if one thing changes, such as rainfall, it changes the biotic and abiotic parameters, as well as their combined responses, and it causes a cascading effect throughout the ecosystem. Thus, the nature of the specific soil changes, either for a period or consistently over time and either positively or negatively, depending on the kind of input and or the disturbances and the specific soil's resilience. These complex interactions produce soils that function as diverse and even distinct biological systems under different sets of conditions, and that we try to understand in order to prevent degradation or restore already degraded soils. So considering this complexity, my focus has been on producing soil microbial research that is practically applicable to the management of the economically and environmentally important ecosystems associated with mining and agriculture. In South Africa, post-mining environments cover vast areas of land and difficulties with achieving sustainable revegetation necessitated investigations into the microbial soil component. My earliest research applied microbial community function, so what the microbial community does in the soil, and structure who the members of this community are, to post-mining environments, mostly to rehabilitated coal discard sites. And we were successful in revealing dominant trends in ecosystem function that were previously not apparent through assessments that only considered above-ground indicators. Similar studies to those on coal discard were done on rehabilitated asbestos mining dumps, informing a larger project that established a rehabilitation prioritization index for South Africa. Importantly, the microbial metrics used in these investigations 
were applied in such a way that results were comparable between studies. The work concluded with a re-evaluation of the RPI and recommendations to government on how a database for rehabilitation could benefit from the inclusion of microbial metrics. These studies used enzymatic activities, viable microbial biomass, and abundance of specific functional groups of microorganisms based on phospholipid fatty acid analysis. This method became an important component of my research. So let me first explain that to you in more detail. So phospholipid-derived fatty acids, or PLFAs for short, are essential components of the cell membranes of microorganisms. They are arranged in a bilayer with a hydrophilic head. This means the head likes water. Therefore, it's on the outside of the layer. And two hydrophobic, so they really dislike water, fatty acid tails that are arranged um, towards one another inside the bilayer. These fatty acid tails have different chemical structures based on which microorganisms they come from. And we therefore assign them to specific microbial classes. And in doing that, we can use them as biomarkers or chemotaxonomic markers of different functional groups of microorganisms. PLFA analysis entails the extraction of lipids from soil, followed by fractionation into lipid classes, derivatization of fatty acids into their methyl esters, and finally, quantification by means of hyphenated mass spectrometry. This provides information regarding the microbial community in three ways. Firstly, when microbial cells die, PLFAs break down quickly. So the total PLFA in the sample will represent only the viable biomass. Secondly, we can get a fingerprint of the community. So from the results of the quantification, we can tell what the relative proportions of functional groups in a sample are, such as fungi, gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria, and so on. And lastly, some bacteria respond to environmental stress by changing the specific fatty acids in their cell membrane. And these changes allow for insight into the metabolic state of these bacteria. For example, whether they experience physiological stress. So back to studying the soil microbiomes of post-mining environments. One of the major constraints of soil quality assessments on rehabilitated sites is the lack of long-term assessments. In 2011, we published an article that addressed this limitation by applying the principle of space for time substitution to two post-mining um, chrono sequences. Space for time substitution is a technique used in ecological studies to infer a temporal trend from a study of different aged sites. And before this publication, it had not been applied in the context of rehabilitation or with microbial community metrics. Again, enzymatic activities and PLFA profiles. The study was successful in showing the long-term effect of rehabilitation on coal discard sites aged from one to 17 years. The most important finding was that we could distinguish sites based on changes or differences in management practices rather than age, and that these practices were the determining factor in the success of restoring soil processes after disturbance. Moreover, we were able to distinguish more successful from less successful practices and make substantial, substantiated recommendations to the mining companies involved to inform their management decisions. One of these were that the application of a thicker layer of topsoil at the start of rehabilitation and no follow-up inputs of fertilizer had a greater positive impact over time than a thinner layer of, of topsoil at the start with annual application of fertilizer to the sites. The success of this study was due to the inclusion of microbial metrics as opposed to using only above-ground indicators such as vegetation growth. The health of agricultural soils is also of primary importance globally and pertinent to food security. But traditional agricultural practices 
or potentially devastating to soils and considered a disturbance. Therefore, I considered that the principles applied for soil health assessments of post-mining sites could also be applied to the agricultural context, and my research entered a next phase. One of the leading problems in agriculture is the extensive use of pesticides, and concerns about adverse effects on human and environmental health initiate <coughs> sorry, a more research into alternatives such as biofumigants and bionematicides. One of the drawbacks of such biocontrol products is the lack of information about their in situ effects on soil microbes and on non-target species, such as earthworms. In other words, what happens to the good organisms in the soil when we put these so-called environmentally friendly products into it to combat the bad ones? Our research contributed to these knowledge gaps by utilizing assessments of microbial community function and structure to clarify the specific effects of chemical fumigants versus biofumigants. Since microorganisms are not used as indicators in the same manner as other soil organisms, it was informative to compare it to earthworms that are known indicators of soil ecotoxicological effects at another level of the so soil food web. In another study <coughs> on the effect of glyphosate on soil microbial communities and nematode diversity, we showed, that the, we showed the relatively low impact on these biological groups, but a correlation between changes in the community structures of microorganisms and nematodes. A further concern in agriculture is physical disturbance through tillage and then also the excessive application of chemical fertilizers that lead to soil degradation and a decrease in arable soils. The need for agricultural practices to be less detrimental to the natural soil condition and more conducive to soil resilience has never been more important. We assess the influence of different degrees of soil disturbance and cropping systems on soil microbial communities and nematodes as indicators of soil health and crop productivity. Important findings were that crop rotation and zero tillage practices increased nematode trophic linkages, whereas plant feeding nematodes declined over time in soils subjected to conventional tillage practices. Zero tillage and crop rotation over time were also found to increase soil microbial richness and evenness. So the PLFA method for characterization of microbial community structure was applied consistently in my research prior to 2015. And although th this method has been in use for decades, uh, since the 1980s in fact, its application is extremely varied and includes other matrices besides soil. An important focus of my work was to apply the PLFA method in such a way as to facilitate comparison of microbial community structure between different types of soils and management practices. Over time, the work showed that although the method was highly suitable and valued in the field of soil microbiology, it was also flawed. We determined that many of these flaws stemmed from modifications to the original method by researchers around the globe. Another obstacle was the discrepancies in the interpretation of PLFA data, which does not facilitate comparison between different studies. This critical investigation of a historically fundamental method in soil microbiology was published in two highly cited articles that contributed new perspectives on a method reviewed several times before. Both articles were also cited in a Springer Protocols publication in 2016. And these are internationally regarded as reference works in biological sciences. <laughs> Based on the development of my own research and the insight gained from critically reviewing the PLFA method, we investigated a positive alterna possible alternative by using a metabolomics approach that was published in the highly regarded journal Soil Biology and Biochemistry. This work was the culmination of my previous research and the starting point for the next phase, 
that focused on the application of metabolomics to investigate microbial biocontrol in agricultural soils. So root knot nematodes are one of the most destructive phytopathogens of crops globally, and there is growing interest in the use of microbial pesticides to combat them. Early studies hypothesized that Bacillus species, which is a, a soil bacterium, had potentially nematicidal secondary metabolites, meaning they could secrete metabolites that would inhibit um, damaging nematodes in the soil. Yet few studies have characterized these metabolites, and their identities remain largely unknown. In a highly cited review published in 2019 and with more than 60 citations to date, we examined metabolomics and the importance of cultivation conditions for detection and identification of nematicidal compounds. This review was key because using metabolomics in biocontrol studies was new. Characterizing soil microbiomes that suppress plant parasitic nematodes is important for identification of relevant secondary metabolites and also as part of a sustainable integrated pest management approach. Two of our studies contributed in this regard. One investigated the soil microbiomes associated with subtropical fruit trees where it was found that the nematode suppression potential of different soil microbiomes highly depends on both the abundance and diversity of fungal and bacterial strains present in the soil. The other study was on the microbiomes of soybean fields. Soybean is among South Africa's top crops in terms of production figures, and the past few years have seen increasing damage by plant parasitic nematode infections. The confirmed presence of Meloidogyne and Pratilinga species can cripple the country's production. However, little is known about the soil microbial communities associated with soybean in relation to different levels of these nematode infestations. Our work started with testing the secondary metabolites of laboratory strains of bacillus species on root knot nematodes and progressed to identifying nematode population assemblages and endemic rhizosphere bacteria associated with soybean fields. This was important to make the research more applicable to agriculture. Identifying bacillus strains that are associated with specific crops and capable of successfully colonizing the rhizosphere and characterizing these secondary metabolites promotes future development of biocontrol agents. More recently, I have also started studying the biological soil crusts or biocrusts of gypsum and serpentine soils. So biocrusts have been described as the living skin of the earth, and they result from an intimate association between soil particles and differing proportions of photoautotrophic and heterotrophic organisms. And they live within or immediately on top of the uppermost millimeters of soil. Soil particles are aggregated through the presence and activity of these often extremotolerant biota that desiccate regularly and that results in a living crust that forms a coherent layer. Biocrusts cover large areas of the ground surface of dry lands worldwide, and they are responsible for a significant portion of primary production. In dry land and desert ecosystems, they ensure soil stability, moisture retention, and carbon and nitrogen fixation. Understanding the functional potential, adaptations, and resilience of these microbiomes is important for the restoration of dryland ecosystem functions and to increase the probability of successful restoration of disturbed areas. Being part of the Global GIP World Project, funded by the European Union, and with Prof. Stefan Siebert as the South African principal investigator, has been an opportunity to put the principles of stewardship into practice. Since the project is based on understanding, knowledge generation, and conservation of these ecologically important and fragile ecosystems. We are looking forward to a number of publications and a PhD study to be completed in the next two years. 
And this brings me to stewardship. In 1949, Aldo Leopold wrote, we abuse land, read soil, because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we might begin to use it with love and respect. Stewardship is an ethical value that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources. And the stewardship of soil microbiomes starts with the science of soil microbiomes. Never has research and knowledge production in this field been so urgently needed. If we are to manage soils for conservation and resilience, we need to understand the nature of soil. If we fail to do so, our soil economy will degrade rapidly and with dire consequences for human well-being. The United States Department of Agriculture identified four key principles for the stewardship of soils. Minimizing disturbance, maximizing soil health, maximizing biodiversity, and maximizing the presence of living roots. Soil microbiomes are integral to all four of these principles, and therefore a key component to stewardship. Soil biodiversity can be clearly identified as a cross-cutting topic in soil health and in ecosystem function. It is at the heart of the alignment of several global agendas, such as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and many multilateral environmental agreements, in particular those related to biodiversity, desertification and climate change. Furthermore, soil biodiversity and ecosystem services will be pivotal for the success of the recently declared UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Knowledge of the generally dominant soil taxa in global microbiomes greatly contribute to unraveling the interactions between edaphic factors, plant traits, and microbiota. The need for agri-food innovations in the framework of the sustainable bioeconomy is another sphere where microbiome science can potentially offer game-changing solutions, if research and knowledge production are supported. What you should remember is that despite all our technological developments, humanity still relies on a few centimeters of soil to survive. More than 90% of the food we consume is produced directly or indirectly from soil. And without healthy soils, we face a range of environmental crises, yet we are slow to act in conserving this dwindling resource. I would like to leave you with this thought. In 1928, the then director of the Illinois Soil Survey, R.A. Smith, said, I cannot conceive of the time when knowledge of soils will be complete. Our expectation is that our successes will build on what has been done as we are building on the work of our predecessors. Almost 100 years later, I could not agree more. Thank you. Can I take a seat? Okay. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> Thank the you. next five minutes will be like five hours. <laughs> okay. Um, how do we do this, Prof. Uh, Modisi? You and I, we are not uh, too different uh, in height. Um, okay. Professor Serena Tlassens, 
our VIP this evening, uh, the Deanery of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Science, led by the Executive Dean, uh, Prof. David Mudise, along with the uh, Deputy Deans, Directors, and staff, our esteemed guests, especially the family and friends of Prof. Serena, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to all of you, those who are present here and those who are joining us online. Good evening, indeed. Hoyanant Dumela. May I also welcome you to this special occasion because it's not just the first for the faculty, Prof. Modise. It's also the first for me. So what a wonderful coincidence. So I hope you'll pardon me if I make a mis mistakes like you did at the beginning. <laughs> Colleagues, uh, this is a ceremony to recognize both talent and achievement. At a personal level though, I just want to say that this is really an important occasion for me uh, because it is the time that I can take break from paper shuffling and reconnect with science. Because these moments of connecting with science are very rare in our day-to-day -day jobs. So I always look forward uh, to inaugural addresses. It is with immense pleasure and pride to welcome Professor Glassens to professorial ranks. Welcome to the ranks of higher privilege and congratulations to this well-deserved milestone. I'm sure this is one of your greatest moments of your life. Your achievements are both commendable and inspirational, and you are indeed a force for good. We trust this is indeed a wonderful moment for you, celebrating this occasion in the presence of your family and your loved ones. Your presentation on the science and stewardship of soil microbiomes is truly fascinating in many respects. But I must also add that I've thoroughly enjoyed it because it's certainly a comfortable space for me. You know that um, as a virologist, you become a glorified microbiologist first. So when you talk about microbes, this is really the field that I am familiar with and is indeed my first love in research. I think it is also a clear testimony that universities remain radical spaces of creativity and deep reflection. And as you said, is a culmination of many years of perseverance and dedication. We thank you for your skilled aptitude in delivering this important topic. I think you left most of us amazed. And this is precisely the gift of a professor, the ability to impart knowledge even to people who are not familiar with the discipline. So thank you for that. But I just want to underscore that understanding and managing soil microbiome is inextricably linked to addressing many SDGs and by extension, our survival as humans. As you pointed out, Prof. Serena, we know that soil microbiology 
can directly and indirectly influence the physical properties of soil, and therefore soil life, soil nutrient availability, root thriving kinetics, and above ground productivity. So the net effect is direct influence on crops, animal survival, and human survival. So it is very clear that while microorganisms can be harmful and also beneficial, overall, they play an important role in soil health which in turn is critical for our survival as humans. So thank you for such an insightful and impressive inaugural lecture, aptly demonstrating your scholarly accomplishments. And if I, as I listened earlier to Prof. Modisi, also you are stealing achievements in training and mentoring the next generation of academics. It doesn't come easy. So we often take for granted the role of academics as supervisors, mentors of their fellow academics and, 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 and professionals, but it's certainly not an easy task. So well done for that stealing achievement. Thank you for reminding us about our role as academics. That our mandate is not just about harnessing the opportunity to create our own legacy. It is about seizing the opportunity to immortalize our names in books, publications, scientific discoveries, and as I mentioned, training the future workforce and leaders. So certainly universities are grounds to educate, transform, nurture, and empower the society. It is not acceptable that it is only a handful of academics who are committed to such a cause. Each and every academic is meant to do this. But unfortunately, it is not the case. I can only sp speak, speak about my space in research and innovation. When we look at the number of professors, the number of senior lecturers in the university, sometimes we get a bleak picture when we try to match productivity and the number of warm bodies that we have. So colleagues, I would like to appeal to each one of you that we have got a task at hand and we should endeavor to be better academics. Prof. Serena, as I said to many before, I promise you will enjoy the new ranks. Is a package of privileged status. You are now a self at unwanted academic expert. You are in a position of power and authority, owing largely to your intellectual curiosity. Professors have a special place in the society. They are well respected, considered trusted source of information, and enjoy many privileges in society. And I hope you will enjoy these privileges wherever you are. Thank you for the service to the university. However, as it was intimated by the dean, this is not a tipping point of your career. It's only the beginning. So we wish you every success. As you know, Northwest University is the home of the Eagles. I trust you shall continue to soar like an eagle in your 
scientific endeavors. May you continue to excel for the benefit of our students, university, and community at large. And maybe I should add the world at large, now that we hear that we are actually gifting another institution with such a wonderful intellectual capital. So unlike Prof. Modise, I know it's heartbreaking uh, for me as a member of uh, university management to lose you. But at the same time, it's gratifying that we are able to gift another institution, not just in the global south in Africa, but elsewhere with a person of your stature. I think it talks a lot about the status of Northwest University. But I hope this is not just you moving, but we will have fruitful and long-lasting and indeed healthy collaborations with you. So thank you once again to all the guests for your attendance. Your august presence is enormously appreciated. This is my message to you. Good evening and be blessed. Please join me on the stage because we have got a souvenir that we would like to hand over to you. I hope I did not forget anything. <laughs> Thank you and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, um, in closing, really the formalities only uh, this time. Uh, so you know, I, I really brought my special fermented soil tie uh, tonight for this occasion. It's my great honor to, uh, to close this meeting. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, th uh, thank on behalf of the faculty, those behind the scenes, Emma and Darlene, and uh, everybody who's been here in, in making this possible. And I'm sure that, that you are, like me, very happy to be, to, to share this, this evening, this special occasion with you and Piet tonight. Um, I would also like to make use of this opportunity, and I'm, sh I'm sure I'll speak on behalf of all the people here, friends, colleagues, your family, and those who have known you and Piet for a very long time, to wish you and Piet uh, uh, great success and happiness in your new adventure in Australia. Uh, we can't help to, to recognize that also to, tonight that you'll be leaving us. Uh, we know uh, uh, you have very deep roots here in Potterstrom. I believe probably Piet's been born here. We know, I've known some school days, so it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, a bittersweet occasion for us. Um, and we wish you well. We, we, we know that you cherish your time here in Potterstrom. That will be a massive part of your life, uh, not only your academic career, but your, your life, uh, really, uh, and what you uh, have been working for. Um, I think as a faculty, we would also like to, to recognize both of your contributions. I would like to make misuse of opportunity to, to do it for both of you. I'm happy to see Piet's name appear there. So I think it's appropriate to do that. Your con both of your contributions, uh, Sarina, yours into uh, the unit uh, of environmental sciences management, but also the School of Biological Sciences, and Piet for setting up metabolomics at biochemistry over many decades now. And I'm sure I'm saying this on behalf of everybody that has been part of, of that. So, but it's not a time to, to be tearful and heilerig and sad. I think it's time to celebrate tonight. 
So I, th I think uh, we must do that uh, to celebrate the special occasion. Uh, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of an evening. So uh, in closing, can you please stand for the national anthem? Thank you very much. <laughs> Standing for the academic procession.